most of his life, Felix Brushelou Brazil had spent his days working the rocky soil of his hillside farm in Roan County, Tennessee. His homestead was nothing more than a one-room cabin with a lean-to shed and a smokehouse all surrounded by a chestnut rail fence that he had built many years before. But for Felix Brazil, this was his kingdom, and sitting high atop the mountain ridge, it commanded one of the finest views of the valley below, where all those good-for-nothing flatlanders lived, nestled down there along the banks of the Emory River. Most folks down in the valley knew of the old man who lived alone at the top of Cave Creek Mountain as Uncle Bush. His felt slouch hat was always perched on top of his head, out of which flowed one of the most fantastic, burly gray mountain man beards ever seen this side of the Cumberland Gap. His face bore the hard lines and hinted of a hard life growing up in the aftermath of the war between the states. Yet, his eyes still had a curious spark in them that made it clear that he was a man who could read another person's worth just as quickly as he could predict the coming weather by the signs of the moon. Uncle Bush's disdain for strangers meant that he kept to himself. But he wasn't alone. No, not by a long shot. He spent every day with his best friend, who just so happened to be a 17-year-old mule, one that the mountain man had simply named Mule. But as Uncle Bush always said, this mule here's got more common sense than pert me or any person I've ever run across. Besides being the right smartest wild beast this side of Mabry's Mill, Uncle Bush had taught Mule all sorts of tricks. Tricks that would boggle the mind of folks who witnessed them. That's the smartest mule I've ever seen, many folks would say. The two were inseparable. From sunup to sundown each day, they worked the corn in the back of patch, and they tilled the ground for the beans, the cabbage, and the taters. And each evening, they would make their way up to the orchard, up behind the cabin, where both Uncle Bush and the mule would watch the day slowly turn to dusk while the two best friends picked apples from the trees. Mule would eat his right there on the spot, while the old man, well, he would just jar his up, let him sit a few months, and drink him later. From time to time, Uncle Bush's childhood sweetheart, Malvina Irwin, would drop in to sit a spell on the front porch with him. Although both of them were in their 70s, neither one of them had ever been married. Most folks said Malvina was still simply waiting on the old man to ask her, and the reason for her frequent visits was simply to see if he had made up his mind yet. But, for his part, there were two things in life that Uncle Bush didn't have much faith in. The first one was preachers. Lord knows what foolishness will come out of one of those fellas' mouth once you give them a spot to preach and a crowd to listen to them, the old man chirped. And the second thing was marriage. Now why in the world would I want to go and ruin a perfectly good relationship with a woman? one that I've loved all my life by marrying her. Lord knows, I ain't never been one to take a liking to arguing and fussing all day, every day, and I ain't fixing to start now, Uncle Bush would say. And so it was, the mountain man and his mule lived isolated from the outside world, season after season, year after year, atop Cave Creek Mountain. He only came down twice a year with mule loaded up with vegetables and fresh mountain dew that he would trade for a new pair of overalls or shotgun shells down at the local general store. One day in the spring of 1938, the owner of the general store down in the valley made the long trek up to the hermit's cabin where he found the old man and mule sitting underneath the shade of a large black walnut tree. Uncle Bush was carved himself a new smoking pipe when he looked up and saw the familiar face. Well, James Wilson, Lord have mercy, come on in and sit a while. What in tarnation brings a fellow like yourself out this way? Well now, I'm afeard it's my duty to deliver some mighty bad news to you. And I've been fretting on exactly how I was going to break it to you the whole time I was traveling up here, the store owner said. Realizing the potential seriousness of the situation, the grizzled old recluse folded his pocket knife and put it in his pocket. Well, I'm listening. Say your piece. I got news a few days ago that Miss Irvin, your Melvina, had taken powerful sick with a fever. The doc came and treated her with balsam oil and turpentine for a couple days. And it looked like she was going to pull through, but without any warning at all, she suddenly took a turn for the worse. James paused for a moment, and the heavy look on his face 
foretold how heavy the next words weighed on his mind. Uncle Bush, I hate to be the one to tell you, but I knowed how you felt towards Melvina. But we lost her last night. There was a long silence, but it was obvious that the news had hit the old man hard, who gazed out towards the mountains in the distance. Death has a way of making everything in a man's world turn to a dull, numbing shade of gray, an aching pain so deep that there are no words that can begin to describe the ripping apart of a man's soul, exposing a vast black void that for the rest of time will never be whole again. They'll be bearing her down at Cave Creek Church tomorrow. Earl Lewis, the Methodist minister, is going to do the officiating, James said. The old man's eyes darted towards the store owner at the very mention of a preacher. It was clear he didn't care too much for that preacher. Now, Uncle Bush, I didn't come here aiming to start any trouble. And I understand your hard feelings towards the ministry after what they said about your pa when he passed years ago. But for the sake of Melvina, would you set all that aside and at least pay your respects at the funeral tomorrow? The old man indeed remembered the words that were spoken at his father's funeral. You see, his pa wasn't the type of man to go to church much back then. And that old snake preacher used his father's funeral as an opportunity to ridicule those who didn't regularly go to the services. In Uncle Bush's mind, it seemed his pa's funeral was more an opportunity for that preacher to rustle up some customers for his church than it was to celebrate and commemorate his father's life. Uncle Bush finally spoke. Me and Mule will be there to pay our respects, but I ain't getting within earshot of that lying preacher. As soon as he's done, we'll say our goodbyes before they lay her in the ground. The next morning, it was a slow, drizzling rain as Mule carried his old friend down the mountain to the little church in the valley. As they approached the cemetery, Uncle Bush rubbed the left side of Mule's neck and, without a word being said, he stopped. There in the distance, the mountain man peered through the rain and watched the funeral service just out of earshot of the preacher's words. And once the crowd dispersed, the drenched mountain man made his way to the wooden casket where he reached into his coat and pulled out some flowers that she had planted near his cabin and he placed them on the ground. With a tear in his eye, the old man whispered, This ain't goodbye. Yes, I'll see you on the other side of the river. A couple months went by, and spring slowly gave way to summer. The store owner had made it a habit of going up and checking on the mountain man every few weeks. Today was no different as he hitched his horse at the gate. Uncle Bush, you old rascal, you might as well build you one of those gazebo things as much time as you spend sitting under that old walnut tree. Hey, that reminds me. I've been meaning to ask you, what are you aiming to do with that old tree? I got a fella that does some trading down at my store and he's been looking for some black walnut lumber. As big as that tree is, oh, you might fetch a mighty fine price. Sorry, friend. The tree ain't for sale. I got plans for it. Plans? What sort of plans? Well, since you asked, I'm going to build a coffin out of it. A coffin? For who? For me. Well, Uncle Bush, ain't nary a thing wrong with you. Why do you need a coffin? Because I got my mind set on having my own funeral in just a few weeks while I'm alive so I can hear exactly what they'll say about me when I'm gone. Now, I need to pause here for just a second. Now, I know what you're thinking. What? A funeral while you're alive? There ain't no such thing. Well, my friend, this is a true story that I'm telling you right now. And Uncle Bush wasn't kidding. That's right. He spent the next few weeks building himself a coffin and working out details of his funeral. At first, the funeral director in Kingston thought he had lost his mind. But after seeing that Uncle Bush was paying for the hearst and the grave digging, he agreed to take him on as a customer. Soon, wagon tongues had spread the story far and wide, and even a local reporter ran a story about the upcoming funeral in the Kingston Weekly newspaper. The Associated Press soon picked up on the story, and within a few days, it was published all across America. All of a sudden, this was shaping up to be the funeral of the century. Newspapers everywhere came to interview the living corpse. Uncle Bush would respond, oh, I know the time won't be long anyhow, because last week a fox got after my chickens, and I missed the fox with my trusty hog-killing rifle. 
that my father used in the Civil War. And I was only a hundred yards away. And right then, I knew something was wrong with me. A double quartet from the popular Chattanooga radio station volunteered to sing at the event. The famous Reverend C.E. Jackson, from all the way up in Illinois, agreed to officiate the event, complete with printed programs. Finally, on the morning of June 26, 1938, on his 74th birthday, a hearse arrived to pick up Felix Bushelow Brazil and take him to the cemetery of Cave Creek Baptist Church in Kingston, Tennessee. As they rumbled down the mountain, along a road that was barely more than a logging trail, Uncle Bush rode in the front seat of the hearse with his homemade coffin in the back and mule in the front of the hearse leading the procession to the graveyard. No one had ever seen anything like this. Every hotel was sold out for a week in advance. Every train, bus, and taxi was filled beyond capacity as folks flocked in from all over America to witness the funeral. Locals began putting homemade signs on tractor trailers and farm equipment saying, one dollar rides to Uncle Bush's funeral. Every road leading to the cemetery was backed up for over seven miles each way and all the fields along the road were turned into parking lots. The highway patrol was on site, directing traffic as best they could. Closer to the cemetery, the roads were completely jammed. Not even the hearse could get through the traffic, as photographers from all over the world snapped their flash bulbs at lightning speed, trying to get a glimpse of the dead man walking. The hearse couldn't get within 500 yards of the church due to the size of the crowd. So they stopped the car and the pallbearers, which were local fox hunters and friends of the deceased man, carried the coffin as Uncle Bush and Mule followed behind. Cheers erupted from the 8,000 people in attendance as cops pushed through the crowd, forming a lane for the funeral party to pass through to the gravesite. All through the air echoed vendors selling everything from ice cold drinks, get your ice cold drinks, fresh sandwiches over here, get your sandwiches. The crowd was packed like sardines. Several people even fainted. Uncle Bush, dressed in the finest clothes he had purchased for the funeral, took a seat in front of his homemade black walnut casket, adorned with thousands of flowers. The Reverend C.E. Jackson stepped to the microphone. Folks, let's begin with silence, please. The huge sweating crowd stood silent while pressing to the center, trying to get a glimpse of Uncle Bush as the tall sycamore trees in the rural church cemetery gently moved in a small breeze. Children were thrust high on their parents' shoulders. Soon, musicians from Knoxville, Chattanooga, and Kingston began singing the old gospel song, On Jordan's Stormy Banks I Stand. Then the preacher opened with the 23rd Psalms and then began his eulogy. Friends, I hope you people don't think this is an exhibition or an extravaganza, because it's not. It's way more serious than many of you people realize. The crowd grew quiet as Uncle Bush looked on. It's interesting to find an individual of this type, one who finds time to look into the future and consider his life. It might be a wholesome thing if everybody could hear his own funeral preached. Heck, it might do a lot of you in a heap of good to have to face the music of your life while you were still around to hear it. By God, it might improve your way of living. As the sermon went on, Uncle Bush had a sparkle in his eye and even a slight smile escaped his lips as he heard the preacher heap praise on him and referred to him as an exemplary citizen. By all accounts, the funeral was a huge success. Uncle Bush declared it the finest funeral he had ever attended. And after the funeral, he spent several hours signing programs with his ex as cops tried to sort out the traffic nightmare. This will be my only funeral, Uncle Bush declared. And I'm mighty pleased with it. When I die, there won't be another. And it turns out he was a man of his word. You see, five years later, in 1943, Uncle Bush did in fact die. There was no singing, no preaching, and no funeral. They buried him right there in the spot where he'd had his funeral five years earlier, right beside his childhood sweetheart, Melvina. What about you, my friend? What do you think about having your own funeral while you were still around to hear what folks would say about you? Let me know in the comments below. <laughs>